Good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, happy Sabbath. It's Friday evening, and I have to admit that it's not easy for none of you to watch a message uh, online after a uh, long day of labor. I know by personal experience that uh, Friday, it's the longest day, the hardest day, the day with the most amount of events that can occur in the life of a Sabbath keeper. Today, by God's grace, I would like to introduce to you a subject, and the title of this subject is called Christ, the only hope. Uh, we are living in a world that is boiling. We are facing as Christianity a total war. Uh, coming from uh, the enemy of our souls. But there is a hope for those that really love Jesus Christ. I would like to introduce to you one of the most tremendous, uh, solemn texts of the Scripture that can be found in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11. Let us read. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that will be authored very, very soon. We don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ will pronounce these words, but there is a moment when the uh, investigative judgment will be ending. There is a moment when mercy will end as well. There is a time when grace of God, the grace of God will be ending as well. There is a time when character formation will freeze forever. There is a very interesting moment in the history of humanity when the time and the work for salvation and redemption of humanity will end in the sanctuary. One out of three people say, I'm hungry. Two out of three says, I'm thirsty. And three out of three say, I'm afraid. This is the world in which we live, my dear brothers and sisters. Recently, I stumbled on a statement uh, on the media regarding a UCSB teaching assistant saying that he would assassinate Jesus Christ if he will have a time machine to go back in time and kill Jesus. He will also consider murdering Christ before his baptism. The times have arrived that those who will kill you think that will do a work for God. We have reached a time when the Bibles are burning in the streets of America. The modern world has left God, Jesus Christ, and His Word. And we repeat the history of the people of Israel. When God says, if you don't like my government, if you don't like the Word of God, if you don't like uh, the truth, if you don't like to be subjects of my Son, Jesus Christ, then I will give you permission to have a quick bliss of comparison of what it takes to the world to live under the government of old serpent. And here we are, brothers and sisters, a world of 7.8 billion people living under the government of the serpent living under the government of the enemy because we rejected the Word of God, we rejected the Scripture, and today the world needs a time of meditation, a time of reflection if it's better under the government of God or it's better under the government of the serpent. And already I see a great awakening in the side, uh, on the side of the world where people really, really are interested uh, and starving for the Word of God. We live in a world where having a Bible at your home may consist of hate crime. Why? Because stirring up hatred, instigating hate against people, and possessing inflammatory material. This is what they prepare in Scotland and all over the world. We reach the time of the Dark Ages and the atheism of France, brothers and sisters, burning the scriptures in the streets and in the cities. I would like to read a statement made by uh, the President of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, in front of the United Nations. The future does not belong to globalists. The future belongs to patriots. Brothers and sisters, 
I want to tell you tonight that the future belongs to those that have the patience of the saints in this crisis, to those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrew, we have a few beautiful statements that show that the people of God does not make this planet Earth their home. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yeah, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goats' skins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God giving provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The future belong to the people of God that have been martyred, that have been persecuted, that have been tortured over the centuries. And now, when we we do expect the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the most brilliant, extraordinary event that we can assist. But before we see the face of the Lord, before we shall embrace His holy feet, we shall divide ourselves in two, because the world is dividing in majority, in minority. And guess what? The people of God sadly to say, will be divided in betrayers and betrayed. Betrayers will be eventually majority, and betrayed will be those that will stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin will never return to heaven. In fact, one of the most beautiful statements that is written in Faith and Works by Ellen G. White says, None who have had the light of truth will enter into the city of God as commandment breakers. His law lies at the foundation of his government in earth and in heaven. If they have knowingly trampled upon and despised his law on earth, they will not be taken to heaven to do the same work there. There is no change of character when Christ comes. Before this solemn statement, I cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Brothers and sisters, I do believe that you, we all may have the same legitimate concern. Who shall deliver us from this body of death? Long time before Apostle Paul, David has uttered the same concern in Psalm 61. From the end of the earth I will cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. David is the one that has the same concern like Apostle Paul, is the same concern like me and you. You know, brothers and sisters, when we run, we use the legs. 
When we, when we go in the ocean, we use the hand. It's swimming in worries and concerns of this world. He's swimming in problems and troubles that surround him like an ocean, and he's buried to, to his neck. And he's just swimming. And he sees us a rock in the middle of an ocean. And he's looking to the rock. And he sees that the rock is higher than him. He has few attempts to climb the rock from the middle of the ocean. But then he realizes that climbing the rock in the middle of the ocean, it's in a impossibility. And then he looks to the Heavenly Father and he's praying earnestly, saying, lead me to the rock. Bring me to the rock that is higher than me. Bring me to the standard of the character of Christ because he's higher than I can offer as a human being in my human nature, in my sinful nature. David is begging the Heavenly Father to take him on his shoulders from the ocean of worries and bring him in top of the rock the mighty rock, which is the rock of ages for us. I try to think, I try to see the future of the people of God. What's next? The time of trouble? A greater crisis than the one that we have faced this summer? I personally believe so. I believe that we are facing a crisis that has never been experienced by any human being on planet Earth until today. In fact, the spirit of prophecy in great controversy overemphasizes our worries, our concerns. Are we afraid to die? Is this our prior concern? Is this first priority in our thinking? Are we concerned of the fact that we may die or not? So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their fate, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. So that is our fear in the night of Jacob's trouble, brothers and sisters. Our concern is not that if we die or not. Our concern will be if there is one single sin, unconfessed and unrepented. Though God's people will be surrounded by the enemies who are bent upon their destruction, yet the anguish which they suffer is not a dread of persecution. For the truth's sake, they fear that every sin has not been repented of, and that uh, through some fault in themselves, they will fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrong to reveal. Their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. The people of God are not afraid to die. Brothers and sisters, if we are hidden in Christ, if the Lord Jesus Christ is our promise and our confidence in the time of crisis, the only hope is Jesus Christ. We have no reason to fear death. The only reason we fear is sin, unconfessed, unrepentant. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their fate, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. So you see, brothers and sisters, once again, sin is our great enemy. And like Apostle Paul, we can cry with a loud voice, O oh, wretched of me, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Or like David in Psalm 61, we can say with the same utterance, with the same passion, with the same emotional intensity, Lord, bring me to the rock that is higher than me. And I do believe that together tonight, we can utter the same prayer of David. We can utter the same prayer of Apostle Paul. Save us from ourselves. Save us from sin. If there is an enemy, brothers and sisters, that can destroy us, 
itself. My greatest enemy of all times is Livio Todoroyo. I fear that in my power I cannot defeat this beast, but that's why we pray together. That's why I pray to the Lord Jesus. Lord, save me. In spite of my weaknesses, in spite of my infirmities, save me from myself. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11, the Lord Jesus Christ says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Brothers and sisters, it is a terrifying announcement that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reward everyone according to his work. Surprisingly, it doesn't say according to his fate. Basically, brothers and sisters, fate is the profession of what we believe. Fate is a claim that we make. But unless this fate is not substantiated by the fruits that are produced by the Holy Spirit in us, that fate remains just an empty claim of our apartments to God's mercy. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, we have the following statement. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find fate on earth. You see, Luke surprises the same event. When the Son of Man will return, will he find fate on earth? The same Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation makes the same statement in a different phrase that I will come and I will bring with me the reward to be offered to the people according to their works. So here is a little bit of a confusion in Christian world. And uh, we do have uh, the statement from the book of Hebrew, chapter 10, verse 38, that says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. What a beautiful promise the Lord Jesus Christ inspires Apostle Paul to make this statement. Recall the statements from the book of Habakkuk. Now the just shall live by faith. My question to you, brothers and sisters, is why the Lord does not say, Now the unjust shall live by faith. The Bible is plainly clear that the just shall live by by faith. When our Heavenly Father is looking to you, He doesn't see you. He sees His Son, Jesus Christ. And the justice, the uh, honesty, the perfection, the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ is given to you in a corporate fashion based on a signature a contract that God had signed with Jesus Christ when the Lord Jesus has decided to come to die for humanity. The just shall live by faith. Who is the just? The only just person that I ever recall in the scripture is the Lord Jesus Christ. And his justice, his justification, his righteousness, it is given to you not with the purpose of committing sin, but with the purpose to walk on faith as the Lord Jesus Christ has walked. In the Church of God, we did have a theological war that I would say is unnecessary. And the spirit of prophecy, still in faith and works, says, while one class pervert the doctrine of justification by faith and neglect to comply with the conditions. The other cavil over trivialities and neglect. The weightier matters, mercy and the love of God. I think that it's time for the liberals and legalists in our church to reconcile and end the war at the foot of the cross and to go in the sanctuary to look in the eyes of the Lord Jesus, to beat the chest 
and to cry with a loud voice like the publican in the temple. Be merciful unto me. Be merciful unto me, my dear Lord. At the foot of the cross can really truly understand the meaning of life, a life lived in Christ Jesus, a life lived in prayer, in supplication, in total absolute communion with our Heavenly Father, through the intercession of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord Jesus Christ in the sanctuary. I remember Martin Luther, one of the most brilliant minds of the Dark Ages, the man to whom the Lord Jesus Christ has revealed a beautiful message, righteousness by faith. Yet, because of his imperfection of character, he failed to understand some of the significance of this message some of the elements that are profoundly significant in the message of Christ our righteousness. Luther's works, volume 35, Word and Sacrament, Philadelphia Fortress, 1960, page 362. Saint James' epistle is really an epistle of straw, comparing to the other, for it has nothing uh, of the nature of the gospel about it. I consider the epistle of Saint James is not the writing of any apostle. My reason are follower. My reasons are as follows. First, flatly against Saint Paul and all the rest of the scripture, it scribes righteousness to works. If Luther the great reformer did not fully comprehend the work of justification and sanctification. How we, poor and miserable men like me and you, understand and grasp the reconciliation of this beautiful concept. The evangelical world in America in recent times have been confronted with a crisis. A pastor that made uh, an appropriate public statement was forced to resign or he was dismissed. I don't recall exactly the moment, but obviously some followers were eager to defend him. Some were eager to accuse him. And one of the professors, Karen Swallow Pryor, an English professor who recently left Liberty, made a statement, we put so much emphasis on the redemption narrative that we are too willing to excuse sinful behavior and not hold people accountable. It is exactly what happens in the church, brothers and sisters. We are forgiven by Jesus. We go to commit sin again. We are brought to the judge to be forgiven, and we are forgiven. We are released back to the streets. We are doing the same sin, and we pendulate, we oscillate from one side to another side all our life. Today in Portland, Seattle, uh, Chicago, and other states, uh, Today in Portland, Seattle, Chicago, the police is arresting the evildoer in the street, either because he was manifesting himself violently, either uh, because he's burning the buildings, either he's attacking innocent people on the street that are walking peacefully, uh, or uh, for looting and stealing and stuff like robbing the, the stores. And the police is bringing these people to the judge, and the judge is dismissing them, forgiving them, giving them no condemnation, no sense of accountability and responsibility. The police is going back in the street next day and they face the same people, bringing them the next day to the judge. And you have an inner circle that shows how fribble, how crippled our society is. But it's not only the public affair, it's not only the world that is so feeble, so unjust, so confusing. It is because we, as Christians lost the power of example. It is because we as Christians lost the flavor of what is to be hidden in Christ. And the same confusion we have in the church today between grace and the law, between justification by faith and sanctification by faith, it can be perceived and seen on the streets of the world today. But we should not forget that soon we will stand before the one that is the author of mercy and the one that is the author of justice as well. O oh, wretched of me, who shall deliver me from the bandage of this body? Do we even realize what it takes for us 
a hand of dust to face the infinite, awesome God face to face. Job, one of the most extraordinary men that lived on earth, the father of patience, when he saw Jesus, his creator, in chapter 42, he's just abhorred. When Job heard the voice of the Lord out of the whirlwind, he exclaimed, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. When Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and heard the cherub crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts that cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. Daniel, when visited by the holy messenger, says, My comeliness was turning to me into corruption. It was the beloved John who leaned on Jesus' breast and beheld his glory, who fell as one dead before the angel. Seeing the Lord Jesus Christ coming on the clouds of heaven, face to face, will be for me and for you, for all of us, either the most brilliant event, the most expected event of our heart and our soul, or will be the most abhorring meeting with divinity face to face without Jesus, without having his garment of righteousness, without having the gold that is tried by fire, and without having the Holy Spirit that anointed my eyes to see the reality about me, about society, and the reality about this awesome God. And in fact, my dear friends, it is not the work of the sinner to make peace with God, but to accept Christ as his peace and righteousness. Thus, man becomes one with Christ and one with God. So it is not our job to make peace with God. That was the job of Jesus Christ. But our job is to accept Christ and his peace and righteousness. And by doing this, you know what happens? Thus, man becomes one with Christ and one with God, our Heavenly Father. How can we become one with Christ? How can we become one with the Father, accepting Christ, His peace, and His righteousness? In uh, Hebrew chapter 5, verse 7, we do have a delicate moment in the life of Jesus, who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, and to Him that was able to save Him from death, and was heard in that he feared. That's the way we can preserve our relationship with Jesus, our oneness with Jesus Christ, our oneness with our Heavenly Father. Our duty is not to make peace with God. We sinners cannot make peace with God. But I know a man, the man Jesus Christ, that made peace with our Heavenly Father on our behalf. Our duty is to make peace with God and accept Christ as His peace and His righteousness. So if the Lord Jesus Christ offered prayers to our Heavenly Father and supplication with strong crying and tears and to Him the one that was able to save Him from death, how much more we as sinners will utter such prayers to preserve our communion with our Heavenly Father daily, constantly. The Lord Jesus Christ offered His prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears uh, to the Heavenly Father because He could not trust His human nature, brothers and sisters. And He begged God the Father to stay united with Him every single inch of His body, every single cell of His blood, every single moment of His life, Jesus wants to be united 100% with His Heavenly Father. And this is the secret in which Jesus is encouraging us to follow His pattern of salvation and to preserve the beauty of this relationship. If we want to be there, we must be here. 
not through our power, poor, wretched, miserable people, but through the power of Christ, to exposure to Christ in prayer. The more we talk to the Lord Jesus, the more worthless we see ourselves, the more we lose ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we will see his beauty of character being so thirsty to become like him in character. Uh, the spirit of prophecy has a message of encouragement for us in the time of crisis. You don't need to be thinking that there is a special time coming when you are to be crucified. The time to be crucified is just now. Every day, every hour, self is to die. Self is to be crucified. And then when the time comes that the test shall come to God's people in earnest, the everlasting arms are around you. So the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us through the spirit of prophecy, you don't need to be worried that in one day you will be tortured for Christ. You have to be crucified for Christ every day right now and let that time to be taken care of by God. God will seek your opportunity to show and prove to you that he's a God of love, a God of mercy that will bring you to the waves of victory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of man until convincing of his own weakness and striped of all self-sufficiency will yield himself to the control of God. Uh, you know, brethren, towards the end of my subject, I would like to say, though, few things. If the love of God is not appreciated and does not become an abiding principle to soften and subdue the soul, we are utterly lost. The Lord can give no greater manifestation of His love than He has given. If the love of Jesus does not subdue the heart, there are no means by which we can be reached. If we are not provoked to change in our life when we see the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we are utterly lost. It is true that there must be repentance before there is pardon, but the sinner must come to Christ before he can find repentance, brothers and sisters. It is the virtue of Christ that strengthens and enlightens the souls. There so that repentance may be godly and acceptable. Repentance is certainly a gift of Jesus Christ as is forgiveness of sin. What does the spirit of prophecy says? If you repent, in reality, is not you. It is given to you in account of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that produces the repentance. He is the author of your repentance, of your regrets, of your remorse for sin that you have committed. Repentance is certainly a gift of Jesus Christ, as is forgiveness of sin. And farther on, she says, repentance cannot be experienced without Christ, for it is the repentance of which he is the author that is the ground upon which we may apply the pardon. Brothers and sisters, the only hope for us to conquer sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's producing the repentance. He's producing conversion. He's producing the change of our life. What we have to do is that beautiful exposure in prayer. My question to you tonight is, how much time do you spend in Facebook? Is that time at least equal in size with the time that you spend on your knees in the nights when you cannot sleep? Is that time at least equal with the time that you spent watching entertainment or being on phone with somebody talking about someone else? Sin is the greatest enemy of ours. We are in a total war against sin. And the sin is in a total war against us. Self is the greatest enemy we have to fight against. But how? Jesus, the only hope of our salvation. 35 years ago, when I came to the Lord, I had a dream. It was like yesterday. And I dreamed that it was the end of the world. And everybody is brought to judgment. There was a huge table that was covered in white cloth. 
thousands and thousands of people were coming before this huge table with a lamb in their arms. I never seen in my life so many lambs and so many people. It was the day of judgment. And every single person will release the lamb to go under the table that was covered with a white cloth and they had to step aside. And while they were watching their lamb, the sign of their salvation was the following. If the lamb will get out of the table and jump on top of the table to take a piece of bread from Holy Communion, every half a meter or two feet uh, was a plate with bread from Holy Communion. I've seen so many lambs walking under the table without uh, any attempt of taking the bread. Many people were sad. Many were crying. Others were screaming. They have lambs of different sizes, bigger lambs, smaller lambs. And they were uttering the solemn words, I'm lost, I'm lost. As I was gazing upon this scene, my time came. In my dream, I heard the voice of my Heavenly Father. It's your time. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I have received a small, tiny lamb in my arms. But my lamb was so little and so tiny. I heard a voice of God from heaven says, release the lamb. I was arguing with the father in prayer in that dream. And I said, Lord, but my lamb is too small. And uh, again, the heavenly father said, release the lamb. And I said a third time, but Lord, my, my, my lamb is too small and it will not make it on the table and I will lose eternal life. And the third time, my Heavenly Father said, release the lamb with an authority and with a force in his voice that I will never forget. Before I released the lamb, I was talking to the lamb, kissing him, embracing him. And I was telling to that little lamb, which I suspect was Jesus, I said, you are my only hope. Only you can save me because I cannot say so. I was embracing the lamb and it was so dear to my heart. I released the lamb and I stepped back on the side of the, of the, on the side of the table and I was looking. He made few steps and he tried to jump on the table to take the the bread from Holy Communion, but it was too little and he didn't have enough height to jump on the table. He landed down, um, he went again under the uh, the table and he continues his uh, his walk. Again, he had the second attempt. He, he jumped a little bit higher than the first time and he could not manage. I cover my face and I said, Lord, I'm lost. And then he got out the third time, brothers and sisters, in my dream. And the little lamb made a huge effort in the air to make it to the table. And it landed on the table and, and, and it just grasped the piece of bread, ate it. And in that very moment, I screamed, I will be saved. And then I heard the voice of the father. Ye shall never be a rich man. God knew that riches can destroy someone. And I am that type of person. And the Lord keeps me low and humble in my social state. And I praise the Lord for that. Brothers and sisters, the only hope is Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He's the lamb that we can embrace. He's the lamb in which we can put all our prayers, all our faith that he is going to save us. I believe that tonight we will go to our bedroom and before we go to sleep, we kneel down and have a talk heart to heart and mind to mind with our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one that can produce the transformation in our character. And as the Spirit of Prophecy says, it is, it is true, the work of the Holy Spirit that men are led to repentance. It is from Christ that the grace of contrition comes, as well as the gift of pardon. And repentance, as well as forgiveness of sins, is procured only through the atoning blood of Christ. Those whom God pardons, He first make, makes them 
penitent. It is my wish and prayer that tonight we grasp the hope in Jesus Christ that He is the only Savior. He is the only friend that can help us, enable us, convince us to win the war against sin, brothers and sisters. That's my wish and prayer. May the Lord bless us richly in this tremendous time of trouble when we expect a second coming of the Lord. Let's bow our knees and our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Jesus Christ, thy Son. We thank you for the means through which you found salvation for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving up your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive our sins, change and finalize this beautiful and wonderful work of transformation of our characters. You are the one that gives us the will and to do. In the name of Jesus, amen.